Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. We've enjoyed our trip to Romania. I've been in every Eastern European country now except Bulgaria. And uh, we have founded, created centers for inquiry. And uh, we have new ones in, uh, in the Netherlands, Amsterdam, in London in January. We have a center in Warsaw, 43 centers in communities worldwide. Our main concern is the public understanding of science. So science and the public is our program. I'm a professor of philosophy, and have done work on philosophy of science. And so we're interested, I call this planetary uh, humanism, I met at the National Geographic the other day, and I talked about planetary humanism, uh, because uh, change, global change, is so rapid today, largely due to technological discoveries and innovations, and especially because of the new modes of communication with the internet and so on, so that the term has been used, and I'm sure you've heard about it, a global village. We really are a global village. Uh, we, we opened up the center in Beijing in October, and as we were leaving, they want to open one in Shanghai as well. Uh, it seems to me that in one sense, science is the universal language, independent of ideology or anything else, and it's crucial that the public understand, the educated public, but even the grand public, the nature of science. And so uh, this is a very brief outline of what we focus on. I call, we call it secular humanism, but it's really uh, planetary humanism. A new civilization is emerging, has emerged, and is rapidly changing the world uh, as India and China, Africa beginning only, and other parts of the world are participating in this. So the first principle, and that is basic, is the understanding of what is science, and particularly the methods of science. So we're focusing on an effort to convey to the public an appreciation and understanding of how science proceeds. Now obviously, there's not one method by itself. There's not just one method. There are different strategies and different uh, techniques of research. But nonetheless, there are certain underlying principles. And as a philosopher of science, we focused uh, on them. We say that the scientific method of inquiry, the basic term, inquiry, research, uh, is uh, probably the most effective method for testing truth claims that we have. It's an open method in which the grounds of your hypothesis or theories can be tested. It, it, it justifies a hypothesis or theory before the peer group of scientists where you, you publish and there's criticism, there's peer review, but you appeal to evidence, observation, the data in the laboratory, and also you develop theories, mathematical theories, comprehensive theories in which you try to develop regularities or scientific laws that we don't use that much as we did in the past, and integrate them. So the test is both empirical and uh, a theoretical, rationalistic, but it's experimental in the same sense. And many of the great breakthroughs in science have occurred in the area of uh, mathematical explanations, but you have to confirm a theory. So it's the corroboration or the confirmation of a theory, it becomes vital in, uh, in any scientific discipline. And science is moving ahead so rapidly there are so many specialties that it's difficult for anyone, not let alone to know his own discipline, but the specialties within his discipline uh, and other disciplines across the board. But 
we also say that the method of science has proven to be the most reliable method, particularly in the last 500 years since Galileo and Newton, and the greatest progress in advancing the frontiers of knowledge uh, using these standards and criteria of science. But we're interested in the public, and we're, uh, we're trying to say that we ought to apply methods of science, so critical thinking, so in education, we're attempting to reform education. In education, appreciation of the scientific methods of acquired, but also critical thinking, and to apply this to as many fields as possible. Now, it may be difficult to apply the methods of science in some fields, but nonetheless, so there are degrees of precision. Clearly, the natural sciences are the most rigorous, but the, the new sciences, the biological sciences, making great progress, but even the social and the behavioral sciences. I was talking to someone this morning in anthropology here, but my, I, I spent a lot of time uh, investigating the behavioral sciences, and there's so many, and that's an effort to apply these methods uh, to understand the uh, social systems and, uh, in a rigorous way, but it's, it, it's not as effective. But So it's the application of critical thinking that we want to confess. You do not accept a belief claim unless you can corroborate it. You do not accept uh, a theory unless uh, it's open to inspection. And that's why we're skeptical of appeals to authority, to revelation, to intuition, to mysticism, to custom or tradition. And this becomes a powerful tool. And in a, in a democracy, it's crucial that the, the best reliance is the educated system, the educated citizen who will use this, the standards. And this includes skepticism. So we are, and I think I spoke to the director this morning. He asked if we're skeptics about parapsychology. Yes. So we use skeptical methods. As science is continuous with skepticism, you doubt until you can establish a hypothesis and you're willing to change that in the light of new evidence and new theories. So science is fallible. It's not infallible. It's fallible. Open to revision constantly. That's the first point. We call it methodological naturalism. And anyone can participate in that, in any field. If they use the rules of the game, the standards of Part. But second, the great lack today in so many parts of the world is uh, to interpret the meaning of science and uh, uh, how do you put it all together uh, and what does it say? And this becomes very difficult because the scientific advance is so, is so rapid. But we need certain general concepts and categories in order to understand uh, the interdisciplinary nature of science. Of course, the outlook that we defend is scientific naturalism, namely all hypotheses and theories depend upon natural causes, and uh, uh, these natural causes, no occult causes in science, of course, uh, these natural causes are the most effective that we have now, though they may be re revised in, in the future. So it is a kind of physical chemical, the basic physical chemical sciences, uh, subatomic theory, but the principles of physics and chemistry, of course, are basic. But that's not sufficient. So we say that, uh, in fact, uh, we had this, uh, we established a center in China and we took two Nobel Prize winners with us, and one was Mary Murray Gelman, the man who, had, who discovered the quark. And he made this point that simply to know the basic physical chemical components, though essential, is not sufficient. So we are, if you will, non-reductive naturalists because there are different levels of inquiry and you have to develop different principles. So we use physics and chemistry, but also biology, and in biology understand the anatomy, let's say, of the brain, the, the micro neural connections. But over and beyond that, there's a level of psychology, and you develop principles in psychology 
that are not simply reducible to uh, biology, and there are also principles uh, in the social sciences, in economics, for example, or sociology, uh, so that uh, a comprehensive view of nature depends on drawing from all of these sciences and interpreting them. People ask, what is reality? And we say, probably the picture that you have in any one era of human history of the scientific conclusions that have been drawn at that point. 